Okay, we're going to talk about radiation monitoring. Um, so we'll look both at personnel monitoring and then um, some survey equipment, particularly the ones that are most important to us. And there is one major takeaway with this is part of this is you're going to need to use your brain. There's a critical thinking component to this because um, there's some stuff that, frankly, we just can't monitor for. Okay, so there's, there's things that we can capture well with an OSL or with a Geiger counter, and there's things that we can't. So we'll talk about that. Here's my objectives. Um, we'll talk about personnel dosimeters, where they should be worn, um, special procedures and pregnancy policies, as well as some stuff related just to nuclear medicine. Um, We'll look at these different detectors, particularly the ones that are most important to us in our work in the hospital. Um, and we'll talk about radiation survey equipment, calibration, and the survey instruments themselves. Um, the survey instrument stuff, I, I've tried to incorporate as much of the textbook material into that, but I've also brought in some stuff from Oak Ridge uh, that'll be helpful, more hands-on type stuff. So... Um, the reason that we monitor uh, occupationally exposed individuals is to make sure that we keep their occupational exposure well below um, the established <coughs> annual effective dose limits. And then we also want to create an awareness of radiation exposure among the staff and with patients. So I think just by wearing a radiation badge, it keeps me aware of the work that I'm doing and the need to practice safety with it. Um, I like this illustration here. Um, this comes from, from Harvard Medical, and they, uh, I'm going to zoom in on this. Some of the stuff I, honestly, I didn't know until I looked at this illustration, but this is supposed to be a seasonal icon here. The, the red thing on ours right now indicates that it's fall. I never, never knew that, so I guess I think green is summer or spring or something like that. Um, now, one thing that we don't have in our, uh, if you look, if you turn your dosimeter over, or you, I guess you'll have to take it off the badge, there's a little, um, does anyone have a little yellow packet in this window, this little indentation window on yours? Okay, that's important. Um, you'll see that there has to be a separate component for neutrons. Um, therapist, does yours have a little yellow packet? Okay, that's interesting. Um, so these, these OSLs, I'm going to say this several times in the course of this, this discussion, these are not designed to capture alpha particles, neutrons, or positrons. They capture gamma and x-ray really, really well, and they capture beta really well. Um, and that's it. If you want to capture neutrons, you have to have a, a, a separate add-on. So these are required whenever a radiation worker is, could get uh, at least 10% of that annual occupational dose limit, so that'd be 50 millisieverts, and 10% of that is what? Five. So um, that's one of the reasons that we do, uh, the dose limits are what they are for fetal dose, um, is it's 10% of 50, right? Um, and so that's why we, we monitor the fetus as well. Uh, so that policy covers both personnel who are exposed as well as um, pregnant, the pregnancy. Um, most facilities, though, in order to be in complete compliance and avoid lawsuits or anything, um, offer dosimetry devices to anyone who may receive approximately 1% of their annual occupational exposure. That's just an FYI. Well, that's not necessarily something that I'm going to be testing you on because that, that varies by facility that you work at. But the, the main takeaway here is the kind of the simple math of 10% or more of the annual dose of 50 millisieverts, and which we said is 5 millisieverts. So um, the purpose of wearing these is uh, it helps us to have an indication of work habits um, that could lead to an increased exposure. Um, one example of this, uh, the only time I've ever had a high um, monthly dose reading was I was working at a surgical hospital, and we, we 
brought on board a new uh, orthopedic surgeon who required a lot of cross-table lateral hip x-rays post-operative. And I was the early morning technologist, so I was over there with another tech doing those uh, cross-table lateral hips in, in the PACU. And uh, I received a pretty high radiation dose because we didn't have a, a device to hold the film while we were doing those cross-table laterals. And any x-ray tech who's ever done one of these knows that you're, if you're holding the film, you're pretty much pointing the primary beam right at yourself, even if you're wearing a lead apron. It's not necessarily helping. And uh, that became very apparent on my dose report. And we couldn't really find a device that would facilitate the kind of beds that we had to to get the kind of images that we need for our physicians. So we just started rotating through uh, those days, um, who was going to be the early tech when that doctor was there, so that um, rather than getting that exposure, you know, four times a month, I was getting it, you know, one or two times a month. So we, we still were kind of taking one for the team, but we just figured out a way to rotate the team around. Um, that's not necessarily something that, for, just for example, nursing or respiratory would ever have to think about, but it's something that we have to think about. Uh, and it also is going to allow us to determine what types of radiation the person has been uh, exposed to. And we'll talk about how we grade that. But largely it has to do with superficial eye level or what we call deep dose. And so these OSLs are constructed with different filtration devices in them that allow us to make that determination. Was the exposure one that was only sufficient to irradiate the skin? Oh, so that would be like scatter radiation. Um, if we're concerned with the eyes, uh, that's going to be slightly more penetrating than the, uh, the scatter radiation. Um, and then a deep dose would be primary beam. And so the filters allow us to assess that, and we'll look at how that works. So um, we, we need to think a little bit about how these things are constructed, though, um, because it will influence things moving forward. We, these things need to be lightweight and easy to carry and fairly durable. Um, they uh, need to be able to record both a very small radiation exposure and also very large radiation exposures, particularly to um, uh, electromagnetic radiation. Because we, we've already said they're, they're not necessarily going to be that great for particle radiation. Um, they need to be re relatively inexpensive to purchase and maintain. Um, and that's probably... The biggest one, in all honesty, is, is if, the, if these things were prohibitively costly, then we wouldn't employ them. We would figure out some other way of doing what we do. But these are fairly inexpensive to maintain. Um, and they have to, we have to be able to record large numbers of radiation exposures, right? We need to have a way to record things. In all honesty, that's probably the biggest problem that we have with personnel, with radiation monitoring, and I'll talk about that because that's, honestly, that's directly impacted my life. Um, so I'll, I'll give you an example of that uh, here in just a few minutes. Uh, we kind of all know that these need to be worn at collar level. I'm not really even technically wearing mine appropriately right now. If I was actually in the hospital, I would probably move it up here or put it on my scrubs, right? Um, I used to just clip it directly onto thyroid shield or something like that. Um, so down here at chest level is really a little bit too low to be wearing it. Um, it's, ideally, it's up at the collar level. Um, and the reason for that is it is recording what we call an eye dose. Um, and so the only way to accurately do that is to have it relatively close to the eyes. And then also, the thyroid is very radiosensitive. And so again, having it close to a radiosensitive organ is important. Um, if, it's, if we're wearing a, a lead apron as technologists, we need to wear the dosimeter on the outside of the apron. And we're all familiar with that, right? Um, Nuke Med, y'all don't get to wear lead aprons, right? Because if, if, yeah. Do y'all, pregnant therapists or, or Nuke Med techs will wear an apron? That's interesting. I mean, because my understanding is those gamma rays are super, super powerful, right? I mean, so. But it's like, one of those things is like, does it, but it doesn't hurt them not to, you know, True. Like, it's better to wear than not. So. True that. Um, but, I mean, y'all's best defense is going to be just getting in and getting out as quick as you can. Not becoming best friends with your glowing patients. If um, there is a need to be 
uh, to wear a second monitor, like in the case of, of uh, declared pregnancy, um, that needs to be worn at the waist, right? Because it is essentially the baby's monitor at that point. Um, and it will be worn also beneath any lead aprons. That's a second monitor. Second monitor must be worn beneath lead aprons. So, um, and this is, uh, so if, if a technologist is pregnant, they will continue to wear a primary monitor at the level of the collar, and they'll wear a secondary monitor at the level of the waist. So again, primary monitor is for mom, secondary mom monitor is for baby. Um, in the event that an, a dissymmetry, dissymmetry monitor is needed, in the two cases of this would be nuclear medicine and interventional work. Anytime that a hand could be out in the area of the primary beam or um, working with radioisotopes, we will wear a TLD ring badge. So again, these used to be film in the past. They're now TLDs, and so we'll talk a little bit about how those differ from the how those differ from the OSL. Yes. How come like surgeons don't need to wear those? They probably should, but they don't. So she asked, how come surgeons don't have to wear a TLD ring badge? Um, in the same, you could also ask, how come anesthesiologists don't wear badges? Because um, I've had anesthesiologists in surgery all day long with me, um, and they don't wear film badges. Uh, the answer is, it reflects on the choices of that surgical group. If they wanted to, so if they were part of a large hospital, the hospital might provide them with um, primary radiation monitors and possibly even TLDs like they do, like the radiologists wear. Um, but if they're, own, if they're their own separate physician practice group, they would have to, they would have, to have their own dose monitoring program. And honestly, it's just one of those things you can't see it, taste it, touch it, feel it, so who cares? It doesn't affect, I'm already having to pay all this money for um, my liability insurance. Now I'm supposed to pay to wear this stupid thing that tells me I'm getting being exposed to something I can't see. So a lot of physicians just choose not to do it. It's, it is dumb, and it's the same is true with the anesthesiologists. They make the same choice. I had one that complained to me once. I said, don't complain to me, complain to your partners, you know. Um, so these TLDs, they do operate a little bit differently, so we might as well go ahead and talk about how these things work. Inside a TLD ring badge, and you'll see this in my, in my key terms responses, so pay special close attention to this, it has lithium fluoride. Lithium fluoride crystal, um, it, when it's exposed to ionizing radiation, it, um, it, it enters into an, excited, an excitable state, what they call metastable state. And then when that's heated, it will, that, it will drop out of that metastable state back into a stable state, and in the process also emit light, right? So I'll say that again. It has lithium fluoride crystals inside of it. When those are exposed to radiation, they become metastable. When we then heat them under an inspection device, they return to stability and emit light. They glow. We pick up that glowing and we measure the amount of glowing and then we say, okay, this is the exposure that that extremity received, right? And it needs to be worn on the dominant hand, the hand that we're going to use the most. Um, so it does operate differently from the OSL. And that's why it's called a TLD. That stands for thermoluminescent dosimetry. So thermoluminescent, we heat it up and it glows. That's all, that's just a fancy word for it. We heat it up and it glows. Thermoluminescent just means heat it up, it glows. So um, that one's just kind of filed out of way. It is, it's very, very helpful if you're a nuke med to know that. I imagine you will have a registry question related to something about the, T, the TLD as it differs from the OSL. Um, but let's look at this radiation exposure record real quick. I am going to zoom in on this. I don't know that this is going to be super legible. Um, we are going to look at this later on, though, because we had this in our packet. Um, 
and I'm going to ask you, this is what our activity is going to be related to, because these are occasionally audited. Um, for example, if the Joint Commission comes in, they may ask to look at your radiation um, personnel exposure records, and the facility will need to render that um, to those auditors, and they will look at it, they'll, they'll make a determination whether or not that facility is in compliance with radiation safety expectations um, of the NRC. So on this, there, there will be a name indication, um, and there will be three different um, areas that dose are recorded, and it may be recorded as RIMS or as sieverts. That's up to the facility to make that determination, whether they want it in traditional or SI units. Most facilities that I've worked at have reported in traditional units. Um, they will then, there will then be um, the uh, skin, eye, and deep tissue dose, and that has again to do with how the OSL is constructed, so the different kinds of exposure depth, basically. If there's ever an M on this, that means that the exposure was at or below background radiation, okay? So M just kind of means negligible. It doesn't matter, right? Um, why they chose M, I don't know. But M just means forget about it. Oh, and I will point out, so if there's a, there will be a separate column for an extremity badge, so the extremity badge will not indicate if it was surface, deep, or eyes, because I don't have eyes on my hands, right? Um, so it is just that, that extremity reading is going to be limited just to people who are in intervention or in nuclear medicine, or I guess potentially someone who works in brachytherapy. If you're doing surgical brachytherapy stuff, you might be required to wear a ring badge, although I did all sorts of surgical radiation therapy stuff and never had to do ring badges. Okay, so it, again, it goes up to that facility uh, to make those determinations. But generally, if you see a ring badge reading, that person is either working in interventional or nuclear medicine. That is a hint for the activity that's to come. So, um, the, I will go over each one of these monitoring devices. We've already touched pretty uh, thoroughly on the TLDs. So the ones I'm going to focus on are OSL. I will talk a little bit about film badges. Um, the pocket ionization chambers. Uh, so yeah, any questions about TLDs? Because that's about all I'm going to say about the ring badges at this time. Good. Okay, there's two really important things to talk about when we talk about um, the film badges. Uh, number one, we pretty much don't use them anymore. Um, most of, every place I've ever worked at has used these OSL type badges. Okay, um, people still call this a film badge, though it does not have film in it at all. Um, who here has heard a tech talk about film badges or something? Yeah, it does not have film in it. So don't get confused by by that. It's just one of those things that techs tend to still do. Um, to measure a film badge, we need a sensitometer. And what that is, is it's a device. I thought about bringing it in. Um, I'm trying to think what it looks like. I don't know what it looks like. It, it looks like a tennis racket laying on top of a Xerox machine. And you push the tennis racket down, and it reads the film, right? No, I'm not going to Google it. You can Google it. Y'all got yeah. Get off Amazon and look it up. Um, so the, it reads, it is a sensitometer because it's sensitive to the light that moves through the film. So it can read how dark is the film, right? It reads how darkened is the film. And we can then extrapolate that, that the film received, for the film to be this dark, it must have received this amount of exposure, therefore the person received this amount of dose. So I'll say that one more time. We can look at the darkness on the film. We can say the film must have received this exposure, this amount of ionizing radiation, and so the person wearing it must have received this dose, i.e. something in sieverts. You tracking with me? Um, to do that, we are going to plot the reading from the sensitometer 
onto what we call a characteristic curve or an H and D curve. They have a bunch of different names for this thing. I primarily going to call it a characteristic curve. It is sometimes described as S-shaped. Um, it has a toe portion that indicates underexposure. So I'm going to zoom in on this. Because this curve is not going away. This is an important curve when, it, when we're talking about radiation exposure. Um, so I want to point out, first of all, this was first created as a way to understand film photography. That when film photography is exposed to light, there's a certain amount of uh, darkening or exposure uh, in lightening, uh, or I should say darkening in the film case would be not exposure, and lightening would be exposure, right? In the world of x-ray, everything's flipped upside down. So the amount of darkening would be our exposure, the amount of lightening is not exposure, right? But this, this characteristic curve, right, indicates what kind of exposure occurred to that film. So if it was underexposed, you can see down here, it's going to be at the base of the curve right here. This is an area where it's underexposed. Then we reach a slope portion, which is also, just for confusion's sake, sometimes called the gamma of the curve. Um, but this slope portion indicates the amount of contrast that would be in that film. So we sometimes talk about it as the film's latitude. And then there's a portion of it that is an overexposure area or overkill. The film at this point is completely burned out. You can't, if it's an x-ray image, you can't see anything else on it because it's so dark. If it is normal photo photographic film, you can't see anything in it because it's so light, right? But they're both burned out just in their own respective ways. So this is a logarithmic function. And the reason I'm spending so much time on it is because this is still very, 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 very important. Because what we've done is we've taken this notion of film being sensitive to light and we've directly tied that to human beings being sensitive to radiation. So we use the characteristic curve now as dosimetrists and as radiation physicists, as health physicists to talk about underexposure, that this person has not received a dose sufficient for us to track. It's not above background radiation. Then the slope portion of the curve would be an area where we would expect to see response, whether it's an acute radiation syndrome that's escalating in its intensity or some other kind of deterministic effect, like, for example, um, skin burns or cataract formation. It's all going to be along that slope portion of the curve. And then that shoulder part at the top of the curve, we're going to call that overkill. That's the point beyond which it doesn't matter because the thing's dead now, right? Um, so we continue to use the characteristic curve. And in fact, it is the shape that we use to model deterministic effects of radiation exposure. So that is, those are the two important things about film. Film badges. Number one, people still call this a film badge, even though it's not a film badge. Number two, the characteristic curve is still very, very important. It's an important model. So we'll be coming back to it. If you didn't get all of that right now, don't freak out. I am coming back to this thing. It's not going away. So let's talk about our OSLs. These things are really good for beta x-ray and, and gamma radiation exposure. I'll say that again. They're good, good, good. At beta, gamma, and x-ray, they are crap when it comes to the other particulate stuff. They do not work for protons, neutrons, or alpha particles. They do not work for that stuff. So what makes them good for beta and gamma and x-ray? Well, they're as accurate as low as one millirem, which is 10 microsieverts. I put it in millisieverts so you could see all the zeros in front of the milli, right? 0. 0.00001 millisieverts is 10 microsieverts. That's the lowest possible reading it can read. 
Um, and it's sensitive to energies ranging from 5 keV, so that's below the diagnostic spectrum, up to 40 MeV, which is well above anything that we use in therapy. It's in the range of certain gamma rays. I don't know, do y'all, what gamma rays do y'all, do y'all deal with any gamma rays that are in the range of 40 MeV? I mean, that's, that's hot even for a gamma ray, right? Um, so this is useful for, not just for us, I want to stress that, this is also useful for people who are working in power plants and stuff like that. Um, the maximum dose reading for gamma, x-ray, and beta is 10 sieverts, and I want to point out to you, that's enough to kill you. That's enough to kill you five times over. So this thing will keep on reading long after you're dead is what I'm saying. So take some comfort in that. But again, it is crap for alpha, protons, neutrons, the heavier particles. They won't even get through the plastic. So I'm going to um, switch gears just a little bit and talk about the radiation uh, survey instruments. I wanted to run up and grab things. But have we all seen a Geiger-Muller tube? Yeah. Yes. Okay, this one here, um, so we'll talk about Geiger-Muller, and we'll talk particularly about the pancake Geiger-Muller, because it's kind of the workhorse of every hospital I've ever been at. We'll talk about sodium iodine scintillation, which is, I believe, what your well counters are, as well as certain um, gamma spec stuff. So we will look just a little bit at gamma spec. I want you all to understand that these Radio pharmaceuticals and, and any radioisotope has its own fingerprint, um, and so because that's going to help us going forward. We'll look at ion chambers, and we'll also look at proportional counters. Okay. But before I do that, I want to break these these survey instruments down into two broad categories. There's rate meters and there's scalar meters. I'll say that one more time. There's rate meters and scalar meters. A Geiger-Muller counter is pretty much just a rate meter, okay? The ion chambers are going to allow us to possibly toggle between the two. They can do rate or they can do scalar. So what the heck are these terms about? One of them, think about it like a speedometer on your car, okay? The rate meter is telling you what is the speed with which I'm being irradiated by the radioactive craft that's around here, right? It's telling me a rate, a rate of radioactive exposure, okay? Um, I can extrapolate that out to all sorts of things. I can say, well, if I'm getting irradi irradiated at that rate, there must be a lot of contamination here, or this must, this must have a really high rate of decay, right? Um, or in radiation therapy, we will use a rate meter when we're doing certain tests on the linear accelerator to test and see if there's leaks in the vault. Because if I've got the radiation therapy uh, machine on and the Geiger counter is reading something over here in this corner, I know that that portion of shielding is not that great. In fact, the place that I did my radiation therapy training at, there was a corner, there was literally a hot corner of the therapist control console area where everyone knew not to stand except for the student, right? Um, because there was no sign or anything telling you that this is a hot corner, but I learned pretty quickly that if the machine is pointed in that direction, you don't want to stand over there because the radiation is getting right through all the primary shielding. And that was done using a, a Geiger counter. You could hold a Geiger counter up to that corner while the machine was on, and you would hear the rate of exposure that you would receive. Does that make sense? Scalar allows us to more or less sample something in an instant. Okay, so it lets me know instantaneously this is the exposure that's being received in this instant. So rate meter, I want to say this and clarify this really, really, because it is completely useless for the calibration of x-ray equipment, CT equipment, and therapy linear accelerators. It is very, very helpful for nuclear medicine contamination sweeps and things like that, because it is telling me a amount of radiation that I'm receiving at this time. It is not going to be helpful if I need to make an instantaneous reading of what this x-ray machine produced in terms of x-ray, I need to get a scalar instrument, okay? So not a Geiger-Muller counter, something different. It's generally an ion chamber. They work off of similar principles, 
but it's able to say, okay, at this moment right here, this is the amount of radiation you receive, period. Um, so I've got, I've got illustrations here of two different um, models. If I were to zoom in, so the one up top is, is purely just a rate meter. The Geiger Muller is just going to give me a rate. This one down here is a, is a form of a ion chamber, and I don't think we can see it, but it does have different modes. It can go into a rate mode and give me an exposure rate, or I can hit another button and it will go into scalar mode and it will tell me instantaneously this is what we received in this however many second window that I want to determine. So it is typically best if I want to quantify the amount of radiation exposure, I need to use a scalar meter. So if I'm saying, I know that when I turn on this radiation therapy machine and I tell it to make, what is it, two machine units, that that equates to this amount of radiation exposure down to the last photon, right? If I want to sweep an area for beta contamination, right, then I'm going to use a rate meter. I'll use that geiger muller counter in the rate um, setting so that I can sweep the area and say, somewhere around here the thing's going crazy, so I know that this is where the contamination must be. Um, and that's largely done listening, watching very closely, because we wouldn't want to contaminate the probe itself, but keeping it as close as possible to the area that we're sweeping while we listen very closely to the clicks that it's making. I'm terrible at that, um, but some people are really good at that. Um, so if you are, um, consider a career in nuclear medicine. Now there are some common problems with these devices. They can have bad batteries, and in fact, if we're going to store them for any period of time, it's a good idea to take the batteries out of them, because the batteries themselves could corrode, and the device is very sensitive. Um, so we wouldn't want that to happen, we, uh, so it's best to just remove the batteries, occasionally clean off the contacts, things like that. We can have a bad cable, especially if the, if the meter's being used a whole lot. The, any connection point between the cable, particularly the one that's on the wand end of the cable, that, goes, that starts to weaken and we'll get erratic readings. Okay? Um, and then we can have bad range switches. So we want to be really careful with the geiger muller counter. If we think that there's an area of contamination, we want to start pretty high on our range and then dial it gradually down. Because if we're not careful, the thing can jam the needle all the way over. So if I start on the lowest possible setting and I've got something that's really hot, it knocks the needle all the way over on the Geiger counter and it gets jammed there. This is, it's an analog equipment, right? So it's got an old school analog needle on it. Uh, so that could be, and then, but if I have a bad range switch, I would just need, it, I would receive erratic readings, especially if I'm switching between different modes. The machines do have to be calibrated, and I believe a lot of facilities, they say every 13 months. Um, the thinking being that it needs to happen every 12 months. We'll give ourselves 13 just so that we have some overlap time. Typically though, you need to be very careful that if you are have a machine that requires calibration every year or something, you probably need two machines in that facility or you have to schedule your workload around having the machine out, right? because otherwise you might wind up being out of compliance. If you continue to schedule patients who are requiring radioisotope deliveries and you don't have a geiger muller counter there to document um, and do a sweep on the packaging, you're out of compliance. So most facilities will have two geiger muller counters um, and alternate the times in which they're sending them off for recalibration. And then it's important before you ever pick up a uh, Geiger Muller counter to use, check the calibration sticker that it has very recently been calibrated um, so that it's in compliance and also check the source. It will have, I think it's a cesium-137 source on the side of the Geiger Muller. You just hold the pancake detector up to it uh, or the detector up to it and it lets you know that the machine is working appropriately. So the most common one that I've ever seen, and it's the one that we have here at the, at the college, it was what I was hoping to grab, but has everyone seen a, a, a GM counter? 
Not everyone has seen it. I need a show of hands. Who here has seen a uh, Geiger Muller counter? Most everyone has seen one. Okay. Maybe. If, if you have question marks about it, come with me after class. I can show it to you real quickly. Um, what we have here on the college and, and what I've worked with with every facility I've ever been at is a Ludlum. Um, it's made in Texas. It's kind of the workhorse of the industry. It's like the DeWalt tools or the Makita tools of Geiger Muller counters, right? Um, is really good at beta in, in the gamma rays, too, that come from beta emitters. Um, it is somewhat sensitive to alpha. Um, it can be inefficient with gamma, okay? Um, because it has inconsistent responses related to different photon energies. Basically, it, if it, it only, it's kind of one of those people that can only walk, they can't walk and chew gum at the same time. The GM counters the same way. If it got two energy strikes at once, it's only going to read one or the other. Um, so a lot of gamma radiation it might kick out two, two, like a gamma emitter might kick out two different signature um, energies or a number of different signature energies. That's going to confuse the geiger muller counter. It doesn't know what the heck it just saw. Um, anytime we contaminate this thing, it will compromise its use. So if you're using it, particularly in a contamination situation, do not, do not, do not contaminate the probe. Um, this is basically how the insides of it work. And this is important to know. It works very similar to an x-ray tube. This is one of the reasons that we have y'all in physics classes together because I know even probably some of the new med people are thinking, why do I need to know how an x-ray tube works? Well, it works the same as a Geiger-Muller counter um, in that we've got a, a container filled of gas, right? Uh, typically argon gas inside of a container. So we know specifically what the interaction level within this gas should be. So a sealed container full of gas. And there's a needle going into the container that's insulated from the wall of the container. And that needle is going to be positively charged. The needle will be positively charged. And you can see on one end of it, on the left end of it, there's a mica window, which, what do you say, what's mica? It's just something that the x-rays can get through very easily, and yet we can still maintain a sealed container. So it's like aluminum, kind of. Um, the walls of the container are going to be negatively charged. So ionization is the production of an ion pair, Right? The electron that's produced when the argon gas is ionized, that electron is going to be propelled away from the negatively charged wall toward the needle. And when it strikes the needle, that's a click. The Geiger counter is going to go like that, right? So it's directly wired to just an aud an, a very basic um, audible speaker as well as an analog device that measures, that measures the amounts of coulombs or current that was produced. Okay? Um, so it is basically a cathode and anode design, right? Um, where we are using an anode to attract electrons to this needle, not to produce x-rays, but to, to record an exposure. Now, it is worth pointing out with this, let me zoom in just a little bit, because we were, I know there maybe have been some confusion about how this device can have errors, right? Um, so within this argon gas, right, um, if we have, this is a, this beta negative here, this is a gamma ray that's passing through the, the, uh, the Geiger counter, right? So this is the direction in which it's traveling. And right here you can see it produced an ion pair. Right? So since the wall is negatively charged and this guy down here is positively charged, the ion pair, the positively charged argon atom went out here. Right? Where it can very quickly be replenished with an electron. It can steal an electron from something else. The electron is propelled away from the wall toward our little anode where it is registered. Now, here's the problem, though. 
because just like within an x-ray tube, we are accelerating things towards an anode. We're creating a situation where I just accelerated this electron through argon gas to an anode, right? So I have the potential to now produce radiation within the Geiger counter. This, this is why these machines are so sensitive. So let's say, let's just say that this electron that's been accelerated away from the argon atom hits another argon atom, right? Let's say it hits an argon atom over here. Well, now I've just produced another ion pair. So this one could go off on its same merry way, but I just produced another electron that's going to move towards the anode and a positively charged argon atom that's going to move towards the wall, right? Well, let's say it happens again because it can keep on happening. There could be a cascading effect, right, or what we call a resonance cascade where the electrons are just producing more and more electrons, right? So the Geiger-Muller might read that as an energy different than what it was actually exposed to. You tracking with me? That is one of the reasons that it's helpful for detecting gamma or x-ray, um, the presence of it, but it's not going to be very good as a scalar meter as a way of measuring the amount of, of x-ray exposure that received. In fact, I, if I had a Geiger-Muller counter in here in an x-ray machine, I could use it because of the inefficiency of the machine. I could use it to disprove the inverse square law. That's how inefficient the machine is. Now these sidewall GM detectors, it's a very similar measuring device. I've just basically changed out the attachments on the vacuum, right? I'll move from the pancake style attachment to now the little nozzle tube that you can get between the car seats with, right? Um, this tubing here um, can be used now to help us measure gamma radiation because it's steel. And I've got two different ways I can use this thing. I can open it up almost like a lipstick container and I can expose the Geiger tube, the mica portion of the Geiger tube. So I could use it to sweep for beta if I open up the shielding or I can close the shielding like it's closed right now and I can use that steel tube to slow down the gamma in the x-rays. So I just effectively kind of knock down the amount of that cascading effect that's going to occur inside the Geiger counter. I'm using the steel shielding to slow down those photons. Um, so it is used quite a bit to measure gamma exposures. Um, and like I said, with the open shield, we can use it to detect beta. And here's another way of thinking about how that Geiger counter works. It can only catch one ball at one time, right? So that is very helpful as a rate meter, as a way of measuring a rate of exposure. Okay, well, let's, let's change gears just a little bit and talk about sodium iodine scintillation, right? This actually works very similar to our OSL. We talked about OSLs, right? Do we, do we skip past OSL? In a similar fashion, the sodium iodine scintillator is going to use salt, basic salt crystals, to scintillate or to capture radiation exposure. Okay? Uh, this is exclusively used for gamma and x-ray. And, but this is a way that we can have a scalar measurement of exposure. Okay? Um, the problem with it is the background readings are going to be considerably higher. So if you've ever, I don't know, has anyone ever had a chance to play with a sodium iodine scintillation, like a handheld detection device? It measures exposure very rapidly because it, it is very sensitive to background radiation. Um, so we house the, um, the crystal inside of some kind of metal tube and it can be affected by magnets. So we don't need to have magnets close to it. Well, you might be saying, where do we ever have one of these things? Your well counter is a sodium iodine scintillator. 
Okay, so around it, it has a heavy, heavy lead shield that is not just to protect us from the radiation inside the radioisotope that we're using, it's also to protect the scintillator itself. So, um, who here has had a chance to use a well counter? A few of us, Nuke Med only? Okay. Um, if you ever are venturing through Nuke Med department and they're doing their counts or whatever, ask them if you can just watch what they do. They will place a test tube inside of this counter and it will then tell them the, the amount of activity remaining in that isotope at that time. So it's able to give us a freeze frame of what this isotope is capable of right now. And it is using um, the uh, sodium iodine. Now the way that it works is a little bit different, but it is similar enough to this OSL. So the ionization causes the sodium iodine to scintillate, which means to produce light. It produces light, very small amounts of light, that are then fed into a photomultiplier tube, and that's what's actually read. The photomultiplier basically enhances the amount of light that it's produced, and the tube then says, for this amount of light, there must have been this amount of radiation exposure. This is the one that we use most commonly in radiation and radiation, x-ray and radiation therapy, is an ion chamber. Um, they have a bunch of different ways that they look. Our textbook called them a cutie pie because that's what the girls that worked out at Oak Ridge called it because it looked a lot like a blow dryer at that time. Um, that was also called a cutie pie blow dryer. Um, but now we see them, they've got pretty colors. They've got these other ones that look like they're parts of robots. There's a bunch of different ways that they look. I have one that just looks like a, like a large stapler or a plastic thingamajig. It doesn't really look like anything in particular. Um, these are going to be used to measure precisely exposures to photons. So that could be gamma or x-ray. Um, it's an air field detector. It has to be warmed up. And there are different warm-up procedures for different ones. Y'all all know, x-ray students know from working with an ion chamber, all the measurements that we did in the lab this summer were done with an ion chamber. And you remember how long the machine, it took it a minute or more to calibrate and warm up, right? Um, it is affected by temperature and by pressure. A lot of times these things, the one that we have here is just, it's a digital one, so it approximates how an ion chamber works. But true ion chambers, actually the, the gas chamber is open to the atmosphere so that it is directly impacted by temperature and atmospheric pressure and humidity and all those kinds of things. But I guess the final question is, is what about the neutrons, protons, and alpha? Because all I've talked about is detection devices and personnel monitoring devices that can detect beta, gamma, and x-ray. We do not store in our hospitals, in any facility that I've ever worked in, a device or provide people with badges that can measure neutron, proton, or alpha particle radiation exposure. In fact, the devices that are used to detect particulate radiation are largely really, really big. Some of them are so big that you can't pick them up. Like, they require wheels and motors to push them down the hallway. Um, I have had a chance to work one time with an alpha particle scintillator. Um, it plugged in like a Geiger counter, similar to it, but it was very unwieldy and it was only sensitive to alpha particles. It could not pick up beta or gamma radiation exposures. Okay? So case in point here is, I think his name was Alexander Lushenko. He was a KGB double agent who defected from Russia and was feeding information to the, U the UK Secret Service, basically to James Bond. He was giving information to James Bond Vladimir Putin decided he didn't like that, so he slipped some kind of radioisotope into the man's tea, right? Um, and I forget which one it was now. It was, I think it was polonium. It was not a beta particle emitter. It did not emit very much gamma ray. It solely emitted alpha particles. 
So this man is probably one of the few cases that we have on recent record of someone who died from uh, acute radiation syndrome in the in this central nervous system range of exposure. So he received a dose estimated it could kill him 200 times over. He died within four days of poisoning. Scotland Yard, for the first day, didn't know what was happening with him. He just showed up in the hospital. He's confused. He's anemic. His hair is literally falling off of his body. They thought initially that it was, I think, thorium or something like that. But when you held a Geiger counter up to him, nothing it wasn't until that they had some of his sweat around an alpha particle detector that they realized this is the most dangerous post-mortem ever done. His body, they encased in cement and buried, like, I don't remember how deep. His car, they encased in cement and buried. His apartment, they, com- they impounded, and they impounded the, the apartments on either side of him. And he was only in his house for about 10 or 15 minutes that day. They were able to follow his path through the city of London with an alpha particle detector. He had, lot, he had lit up the entire city of London. So I, I bring that up to point out to y'all, if you're ever going into the radiation therapy vault, right? That's what I'm talking about, is neutron contamination. This cannot pick it up. You will be just like Scotland Yard thinking, this is not radiation. This is not radiation. Well, it, it's not going to look like it because this can't detect it. So I put the numbers. The range of high let radiation that your OSL can detect is 200 to 250 microsieverts, right? That, again, is the point zero 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 over. And then it's done. It didn't detect any more, Right? This guy received enough of that kind of radiation to kill him two times, 200 times over. His OSL would have said he was perfectly fine. His OSL would say there was nothing wrong with this person. Right? So as I know that they're in the future, they're talking about having some radiopharmaceuticals that are alpha particle emitters. Right? That's not been something that we've done in the past. Um, I know that right now where we're at, in radiation therapy and in proton therapy, we do not have devices to monitor occupational exposure. They require special devices is what I'm stressing. So if you wind up in the future working with something that's an alpha particle emitter, the first question you need to be asking is, okay, how are we going to monitor exposure? How are we going to do a sweep? And if you're working as a radiation therapist right now, just go ahead and take some time getting into the vault. Because your badge might say zero all day long, but if you're rushing to get into that vault and there's still neutron contamination in there, which is a real thing, you can look it up on Google, um, neutron contamination related to LINAC linear accelerators, and there's all sorts of scientific articles about it. Um, Don't rush to get into that vault. There are neutron traps inside of the vault designed to help get rid of those, and part of it is the vault door needs to open kind of slow. So the best protection is going to be using your brain. Okay, did I scare you all enough?